I'd like to welcome everybody tonight to the College of Conferences. My name is Tim, and I'd like to give, would like to give everybody a well-rounded personal welcome tonight. We appreciate you coming. Tonight's David Ramsey Steele. He's talking about the Church of Global Warming and that nuclear power will be the only way as, it, as the best alternative to oil. There are, let me give you a brief format on how the college is going to run. We have a brief announcements period. Then we have our speaker who speaks. And then we have our question period. And then we have our announcements period afterwards. Let's welcome Mr. David Ramsey Steele with a rousing round of applause. Come on, we can do better than this. Okay. Some of the human species. <laughs> Anybody else who may be paying attention. Um, generally speaking, um, I don't like bad language. I don't like um, the use of offensive words. But I am going to use an offensive word. And um, but I'm going to give fair warning every time I use it. So you can put your fingers in your ears and not listen to this swear word. Uh, so, the offensive word I'm going to employ is that offensive word coming, reality. Okay? Um, that's highly offensive to the pseudoscientific cult of global warming. Um, one of the aspects of, uh, of their dislike for that word coming, reality, uh, is that they keep on making predictions that don't come true. Um, some of you may have heard of Britain. It's a little island off the coast of Europe, and it has a place there called the <coughs> University of East Anglia, which is a center for the pseudoscientific cult of global warming. Um, in the year 2000, Dr. David Viner, who is a senior research scientist, no less, at the Climatic Research Unit of the University of East Anglia, predicted that within a few years, snowfall will become a very, quote, a very rare and exciting event, end quote. Uh, in the course of expanding this, he said, quote, children just aren't going to know what snow is, end quote. Uh, that was in the year 2000. Um, in the year 2004, a man called Adam Watson uh, from the Center for Ecology and Hydrology in Banshori, Aberdeenshire, said that the Scottish skiing industry, Scotland is the northern part of this little island called Britain, uh, had no more than 20 years left. Now, these were predictions made by very authoritative, highly paid and uh, highly qualified people. Um, in 2014, uh, Scotland had the highest uh, snowfall, the highest amount of snowfall in 69 years. Um, and there were problems with ski resorts uh, in Scotland. Uh, they were caused by such heavy snowfall that the ski lifts were buried in snow. So I should say that um, it snows every year in Britain in the winter. Uh, and that hasn't stopped. In fact, it's got, in recent years, it's been getting greater. Um, to give another of these failed predictions by the prophets of the Church of Global Warming, um, this time from in the United States, Dr. Morris Bender, in the year 2010, who was connected with what's called NOAA, N -O -A -A, which is the national Oce Oceanic and Atmospheric um, Administration, which is one of the government bodies which we pay our taxes for to keep an, an eye on the planet and make sure that we all do what we have to do uh, to save the planet from disintegrating at any moment. Uh, and anyway, um, Dr. Morris Bender, uh, he predicted that the, the US Southeast and the Bahamas would be pounded by more very intense hurricanes in the coming decades due to global warming. Uh, now, if you look at the actual statistics um, for hurricanes and other extreme weather events, you see there's been a diminution of these over the past 40 years. 
Uh, in fact, um, there was a very unusual 11-year period without any major landfalls of hurricanes in the U.S. from 2005 to 2016, and this is in the what? NOAA statistics. Um, <clears throat> so, extreme, extreme weather events are getting have been getting less, not not uh, not um, not more frequent. Um, the predictions have been made about uh, Arctic sea ice. In 2017, uh, a professor from the Department of Oceanography of the U.S. Navy predicted an ice-free Arctic Ocean uh, by the summer of 2013. Of course, that didn't happen. Um, in 2007, NASA scientist uh, Jay Zwally predicted that the Arctic Ocean would be nearly ice-free at the end of summer in 2012. Well, um, the amount of ice uh, in the Arctic uh, increases and decreases, fluctuates over time, uh, and uh, it's now increasing again. Uh, all along, by the way, the, um, the amount of ice in the Antarctic has been increasing, so uh, while there was a diminution of Arctic ice, the total amount of ice, sea ice on the, on the Earth's surface uh, remained more or less the same. Um, so, uh, they, the predictions keep on coming, you know, in 2008, um, University of Manitoba professor David Barber predicted an ice-free North Pole for the first time in history in 2008. Well, it, would, it depends how you define history, that the, the North Pole has been ice-free uh, for long periods in the Earth's history. Uh, but if he's talking about recorded history, that would be true, it would be the first time. But it doesn't look as if it's going to happen. Uh, it looks like this is another failed prediction. Um, one, one prediction that was made that caught uh, the imagination was um, the sad plight of polar bears. Um, the various predictions have been made by different august bodies uh, whose officials belong to the um, pseudo-scientific cult of global warming uh, that the polar bear is vulnerable because of the um, predicted 30% decline in, um, in sea ice. So, of course, the decline is now going to reverse. Uh, <clears throat> however, uh, this, this idea that polar bears were endangered was given, um, was given a lot of help by a, an illustration, a photo, that was uh, widely disseminated showing a polar bear on this, on this um, little patch of ice. Now, I'm, it's not clear what that means. Um, I mean, are we all so ignorant that we don't know that polar bears can swim um, and that uh, a healthy, mature polar bear can swim 100 miles? Um, so what, what, is, what are we actually being presented with here? But anyway, the photo was a fake, it was Photoshop. Uh, so <laughs> if you do think that, that some polar bears might have a problem swimming uh, to another patch of ice a few miles away, uh, then uh, you, you've been misled because uh, this was a, this was fake a fake fake news. This uh, this um, fake photo news. Um, so um, and the reality of polar bears uh, is uh, there is a, a, a woman called uh, Susan Rockford, and one of the handouts that I distributed or had people helpfully distribute. Uh, is about the polar bear population. The world's polar, po polar bear population is not declining, uh, and they're, they're not in any danger. And it would be surprising if they were, uh, for this reason, polar bears have been in existence for well over 100,000 years, maybe a lot more than that, but well over 100,000 years. And there have been many periods, long periods, uh, on the Earth where it's been a lot warmer than it is today. Uh, and where there is a lot less ice than today, and the polar bears managed to come through okay. So um, uh, it would be strange if uh, suddenly uh, they were to be in danger. Well, <clears throat> so people keep on making silly predictions that are, um, that are uh, disproven with the passage of a few years. Um, why do they do this? What's going on here? Uh, when intelligent, well-educated, well-qualified, well-paid people uh, take to babbling like idiots, what's the explanation? Well, the explana one explanation is that they're members of a cult. Uh, 
or, an, what, or to be more polite, what I call an enthusiastic belief system. Um, but you may say to me, aren't they scientists? Uh, how can science be a cult? Well, there have been periods in history where uh, uh, science has been taken over by a cult. Uh, the most obvious, um, prominent example is Lysenko. Trofim Lysenko was, uh, I suppose you'd call him a gardener uh, in the Soviet Union, and he caught the attention of Stalin, and he was a big opponent of genetics. And he thought that, um, you know, by, by getting wheat and uh, subjecting it to very low temperatures, you could then make it uh, grow in lower temperatures than wheat otherwise would. He thought, he was against Darwin and Mendel and thought that uh, uh, plants could inherit acquired characteristics, which of course they cannot. Um, and now his ideas were foisted upon the Soviet Union and its satellites uh, uh, in the 20s, 30s and 40s, uh, and it remained official at, at, even after that. Uh, people who preached Mendelian genetics, in other words, the truth about heredity, uh, were uh, persecuted and sometimes executed. Um, so there's a clear case of um, a pseudo-scientific cult masquerading as science. Um, other examples would come from Nazi Germany. You know, um, among, other, among other things, uh, Nazi Germany was opposed to the theory of relativity. Uh, and so uh, people were not allowed to teach the theory, Einstein's theories of relativity. Um, and they were persecuted and uh, barred from teaching positions if they, if they did that kind of thing. So now we see then that science, the, 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 there's nothing preordained that says that people who call themselves scientists are going to get it right. They, science can go off the rails. Uh, and we see in cases like totalitarian states that science can be perverted in the interests of politics. But you may say, well, those are not democracies, those are totalitarian states where people didn't have any rights. Um, but different conditions can bring about the perversion of science. Uh, conditions other than um, a one-party system. So if you look at, uh, look at what has happened to science over, the, over recent decades, you see, first of all, that in many areas of science, it, the, the preponder overwhelming preponderance of the funding comes from the government, government bodies. Um, and uh, the, re the research funding bodies are, are not disinterested. They're susceptible to political pressures. Um, and uh, they may be susceptible to ideologies like greenism. Uh, or they may, or they may um, just be uh, distracted by a general concern with certain fashionable uh, issues. So there are various examples of this aside from the government promotion of global warming. Uh, there is the government's promotion of the low-fat diet. Uh, you know, that um, the government wanted everybody to, uh, to um, give the highest incomes to American farmers by eating lots of grains. Uh, and so they set about, um, it's a bit more complicated than this, but you can read about it in, um, in an excellent book, with a sort of brilliant piece of uh, history and detective work by uh, Nina Teichel, it's called The Big Fat Surprise. Uh, she, uh, she shows in that book how um, uh, bogus research and bogus science captured the government, and the government put out propaganda telling people to cut down on fat and cholesterol and increase, uh, automatically that implies that you increase your intake of carbohydrates, in other words, grain-based foods, um, which is the precisely the opposite of what they ought to have been saying, in my opinion. Um, but anyway, that happened. And, the, uh, and so, uh, for decades, the government preached, uh, and, all, and lots of loyal devotees of this cult, the low-fat cult, preached the idea that heart attacks are caused by eating um, fatty things. And that's going to uh, increase the cholesterol 
and it's going to give you heart attacks. So that was the message. Um, just now, this is crumbling. This whole ideology is crumbling. And there's beginning to be a backpedaling. And a, a rather disingenuous and insincere kind of compromise is being, instead of just telling people that was a huge mistake, a, a huge hoax, um, a huge blunder. Um, but if you read Nina Tykolz's book, that's the first book you should read on the subject. She lays it out exactly how it happened. Uh, she shows how one person um, was so tremendously influential and was the kind of um, vindictive academic who uh, went after people who opposed him and made sure they didn't get funding and that sort of thing. So the whole uh, pseudo-scientific nonsense of the low-fat diet was promoted by the government for, for decades. It's not, it's not over yet. You still see people saying fat-free as though that's a recommendation. <laughs> it's the exact opposite of a recommendation. Um, but anyway, um, another, an another idea <coughs> that is uh, pseudo-scientific cult that is promoted by the government is this uh, obsession with uh, pharma pharmaceuticals to cure human problems. You know, if you're depressed, suicidal, or um, uh, you know, that you have problems in your life, uh, the thing to do is to um, rebalance the chemicals in your brain. Um, uh, and this, is, this has become uh, <coughs> crowded out all other approaches crowded out psychotherapy, it's crowded out um, behavior modification, which was in the 1970s, so this happens to be something I'm interested in, in the 1970s there was a great, great strides were being made in behavior modification, and they found, for example, that if you take the most hopeless psychotics in mental homes, or the most hopeless uh, alcoholics, and you rewarded them for good behavior, they would respond to these incentives. Uh, so the, 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 uh, the most hardened alcoholics would moderate their intake of alcohol if they were rewarded systematically and consistently for doing so. Um, and there, there were quite a number of very interesting papers and it was, it was a developing field. And then by the 1980s that was all swamped out by this uh, obsession with giving people drugs. Um, and if you just watch your TV set in the evening, watch the ads, you know, we're being taken over by the drug companies in collusion with the government. Uh, and if the, the book you should read, the first book you should read on that is a book called Blaming the Brain uh, by Elliot Valenstein. Um, so, I, so I don't think that, um, I don't think that the, the pseudo-scientific cult of global warming is unique. I think, we, I think uh, we see other examples of pseudo-scientific cults masquerading as science being promoted by the government. Uh, and um, what's, what, the thing that is <coughs> pseudo-scientific about them is they're impervious to contrary evidence. That's the thing. That's, that's what makes them pseudo-scientific, not the fact that, that I disagree with them or that anybody else agrees with them or anything like that. It's, it's their imperviousness to contrary evidence, uh, which, which brands them as pseudo-scientific. Um, okay, now let me say a little bit about, um, about the whole global warming issue. Um, there is this entity called the sun. It's 93 and a half million miles away. It's blasting out photons in all directions. Um, and um, most of, most of the, uh, the radiation that comes to the Earth from the sun is shortwave, it's visible light or it's ultraviolet light. And the, the visible light is what we should focus our attention on um, <clears throat> because nothing can really stop the ultraviolet light. So <clears throat> quite a large amount of this visible light that comes from the sun is reflected right back into space, mainly by low white clouds. Low white clouds are what reflects 30, nearly 30% 30 of uh, this visible light back into space. Um, so the, the other 70% or so, apart from a little bit that's reflected by snow and ice, um, is absorbed by the Earth's surface. The Earth's surface is 71% ocean or water, 29% uh, land. Um, and so the Earth's surface absorbs this visible light and this ultraviolet light from the sun. Uh, and the Earth 
uh, emits not visible light, not ultraviolet light, but infrared. And infrared is what we loosely call heat. Infrared is heat. So if you feel heat from a hot stove or something, that's infrared. Now, everything on the surface of the Earth is emitting infrared radiation. It's just the hotter things uh, are emitting more of it than the colder things. But a, a snowflake or an iceberg, they emit infrared radiation. Um, <clears throat> The reason they emit uh, infrared radiation and not visible light is because they're not as hot as the sun. The hotter the source of the radiation, the shorter the wavelength. So <clears throat> it just so happens that uh, longer wavelength energy, uh, the, the, the atmosphere is not so transparent to long wavelength energy as it is to the short one. So the energy which got, in, got down to the Earth's surface that which wasn't reflected back in space that got to the Earth's surface quite easily and un without any obstruction. Uh, now it's being re-emitted as infrared. It doesn't get out of the atmosphere as easily as it got in. So uh, if you want to get melodramatic, you can say it's trapped in the atmosphere. So this is what's called the greenhouse effect. Um, and the greenhouse effect is responsible for the fact that we're here. We, without the greenhouse effect, we could never have evolved on this planet. It would have been too cold. So we rely on the greenhouse effect every day to keep the temperature warm enough for us to survive. Uh, <clears throat> and we could never have come into existence in the first place except for the greenhouse effect. Yeah, that's good. So, <clears throat> um, uh, the, the people who are skeptical about the pseudoscientific cult of global warming uh, are often, often accused of being deniers. And of course, if you deny something that's false, that's good. If you deny something that's true, that's bad. So uh, it's fine that we're deniers. Uh, but what is it exactly that we deny? Uh, now, if you listen to yeah. um, propagandists for the pseudoscientific cult of global warming, you get the impression that their critics uh, deny that there is a greenhouse effect. Well, we don't deny that. No one denies that. Um, you get the impression that their critics deny that there has been warming of the Earth for the last 170 years. Well, we don't deny that. Of course, <coughs> this warming that's been going on for the last 170 years uh, follows one of the coldest episodes of this, that this planet has undergone in the last few thousand years, which is, which is colloquially known <coughs> as the Little Ice Age, which ended in about 1850. Um, uh, so, and, and that was one of the, that was uh, the, the coldest episode for, for 10,000 years or so uh, in, in, in the history of the Earth. So it's not surprising we're rebounding from that. Uh, and it, it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with <coughs> changes in the, in the gaseous composition of the atmosphere. Um, now, the people who deny the, the uh, tenets of this cult, um, we don't deny that uh, a certain amount of the uh, warming that is going on is due to uh, the addition of CO2 to the atmosphere. And the, the, the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere has increased, uh, but not it didn't increase in 1850 to any appreciable extent. It, it started increasing really appreciably uh, in 1950, after uh, the warming had already been going on for 100 years. So what we do say is that the, um, the, the human contribution is slight and benign. It's better to be warm than it is to be cold. Uh, now, <clears throat> basic physics tells us that uh, doubling of CO2, which of course hasn't happened yet, um, we're a long way from the doubling, although we may get there uh, <clears throat> eventually, uh, will raise temp uh, the Earth's the global temperature by one degree Celsius, which is, a, which is both minor and benign, uh, since we're below the optimal temperature for human beings, or for the, the ecosystem for that matter. Um, uh, that's a good thing, uh, and it's very moderate. And uh, so, uh, so what the, uh, the cult of global warming is preaching is not basic physics, it's something else. They have a theory that because of warming that is caused by 
CO2. There will be runaway warming caused by a, a subsequent increase in water vapor. Now you have to understand that CO2 is a very unimportant greenhouse gas compared with water vapor. The vast majority of the greenhouse effect is due to water vapor and not to carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, let's say the 400 parts per million, in, in other words, four ten thousandths of this stuff here uh, is CO2. Uh, water vapor, it may be, it varies considerably from place to place, but it may be much, much higher than that. Um, so water vapor is, if you're going to talk about uh, greenhouse gases, you, you're thinking mainly of water vapor. So they have this theory that CO2 causes a certain amount of warming. Then there is uh, positive feedback, which causes an increase in water vapor, uh, and uh, that, will in, that will create runaway warming. What's the evidence for this? Absolutely not, none. There is no evidence no, whatsoever that this happens. Um, now, um, there are feedbacks, uh, and one can think of feedbacks. You can, I mean, right away you can say one of the things that may happen is there may be more low white clouds, and that would cause more radiation back, into, uh, reflection back into space, and that would um, offset um, <coughs> the um, uh, the effect of, the, of um, the, the, the CO2, so it might be a lot less than one degree Celsius. Um, and there are various other mechanisms that have been proposed that are negative feedbacks. And, and by the way, um, nature's full of negative feedbacks. Positive feedbacks are very rare. So you, you might expect um, <coughs> that uh, you would find negative feedbacks. Um, <coughs> so so um, this is where this is where the, uh, the, the global warming people and the skeptics disagree. They don't disagree over whether there is global warming. They don't disagree over the greenhouse effect. What they disagree on is how sensitive the climate is to an increase in CO2. Uh, they, they think it's uh, tremendously sensitive. Uh, the skeptics think that it's uh, insensitive. Uh, and that sensitivity is measured by the response of the global temperature to a doubling of CO2. Uh, and the way this works, if you double CO2, you get a certain increase in temperature. If you double it again, you don't get twice that increase, in other words, four times where you started. You get the same amount. In other words, it's like a logarithm. The increase is uh, declined steeply. Uh, as you uh, as you go on, so so these are the, 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 let me tell you what I think. Uh, I, I've been reading about this stuff uh, actually since I've been reading about this stuff since 1991, when I first became interested in, in uh, global warming as an issue. Um, and the thing that most weighs with me uh, in being suspicious to start with of the of the global warming people. Uh, is the history of the Earth and the fact that there have been so many episodes in the history of the Earth when it was much, much, much warmer than it is today. There have been periods in the history of the Earth where all the ice on the, on the Earth disappeared completely. Uh, even in the last 13,000 years, which is the end of the last glaciation, when the ice melted, um, <clears throat> so we've had about 12 or 13,000 years of this interglacial, uh, there have been several periods much warmer than today. The medieval Roman period was a bit warmer than today. The Roman War period 2,000 years ago was warmer than the medieval War period. The Minoan War period was warmer than the Roman War period. Right, the Holocene Optimum, as they used to call it, because that's unfashionable, was even warmer. You notice the warm periods get colder and colder, and that's because we're inevitably slipping back into a period of glaciation. And what that means is that <clears throat> the United States will no longer exist, of course. The United States will be like Greenland. Uh, what we now call Chicago will be beneath more than a kilometer of ice, which is very heavy, uh, and it will be moving, it will be scraping out new lakes, new Yay! valleys, creating new hills, um, to completely changing the topography uh, of this part of the planet. Um, and it's inevitable that's going to happen. Uh, there's no way of stopping it that I know of, um, and that's why <clears throat> that's why all these warm periods get colder and colder. Um, and in fact, if you go back, say, 10,000 years, each successive thousand-year period has been colder than the one before. This, this 
thousand year period that just ended was colder than the thousand year period that, that preceded it, which was colder than the thousand year period which preceded it, and so on, back for 10,000 years. Um, so, and furthermore, if we look at this, um, we don't see any sign of this runaway. When it gets warmer, we don't see it. The medieval warm period, it was warmer. Um, it was warmer than it is today. Uh, they found in Greenland, the Vikings landed in Greenland, and for a while they flourished because it was warmer than it is today. Um, and they could practice agriculture, and they were beginning to build, build up a, uh, quite a thriving and growing civilization in Greenland, but then it got cold again, a little, little ice age started. And they have recently found the top of a well. Uh, they didn't know it was there. Only the top has thawed. The great majority, 99% of the well is still frozen solid. Uh, but the top has thawed. And by the way, when you hear about these shrinking, shrinking glaciers, one of the interesting things, they occasionally let this out because they, <clears throat> I suppose they don't see the significance of it. But whenever you hear that a glacier is melted, one of the things that you, that you occasionally will see mentioned is that what happens when the glacier retreats due to melt? They find houses, churches, all kinds of other uh, signs of human civilization. In other words, the glaciers which exist are new glaciers. Uh, they didn't exist 10,000 years ago. Uh, now they wax and wane several times uh, as we go down into the new uh, glaciation. <coughs> so. It's the whole history of the Earth which, to me, uh, convinces me there's something wrong with the global warming theory. So, um, I'm going to conclude by listing some paradoxes. There are paradoxes of this, uh, from an, purely from an intellectual, cognitive point of view, there are paradoxes. Um, the first thing that I find to be paradoxical is that if the deniers, the skeptics, got their way, if we got our way, right, tomorrow, we suddenly got what we wanted, then there would be a huge diminution of the use of fossil fuels. Enormous reduction in the burning of fossil fuels. Now, does that surprise anybody? Uh, and that's because um, more than 95% of people are skeptical about global warming are in favor of nuclear power and more than 95% of people who are believers in the global warming cult are opponents of nuclear power. So that's why I say if the skeptics on global warming got their way, there would be a huge diminution in the use of fossil fuels. Now, <clears throat> prior to 1991, um, I was in, the only energy thing I was interested in was nuclear power because I could see that all kinds of bogus anti-scientific uh, arguments were being used against it. So I got interested, and at that time, in the eight, late 80s, uh, early 90s, it was quite com common, this is, what I this is when I first heard of global warming, uh, to say that one of the reasons we need nuclear power is because uh, it will save us from global warming. And Margaret Thatcher was a big a proponent of this argument. I heard her put this argument. Um, uh, one of the reasons for going for nuclear, actually, she wanted to, the reason she wanted to go for nuclear power which was, was because at that time the great power of the miners' union in Britain <laughs> kept bringing the country to a standstill. That, so that's why she wanted it. But she would, like any good politician, she'd whip up any, any argument she could think of. And one of the arguments that she came up with was, um, that was fed to her by her advisors, was there's this, there's this threat of global warming. Uh, and we can stop it by going, going nuclear. So that was, that, so I, I, I accepted this at the time. I, I believed it. And I used to use this argument. I used to say, you know, another argument for nuclear power is uh, we won't have global warming because we'll cut the use, we'll cut the uh, <coughs> burning of fossil fuels and we won't emit so much CO2. Um, so uh, I, ch I suddenly changed my, well, I suddenly began to have suspicions about it in 1991. Um, and uh, then I read a lot of, uh, read up on it and found out what was what. Um, so <clears throat> this is the first paradox, uh, that um, if you give the deniers, the skeptics, their way, there will be a great reduction in the burning of fossil fuels, and therefore uh, a great reduction in emissions of carbon dioxide. Not because 
the skeptics are afraid of carbon dioxide, but because the skeptics, it so, so happens, statistically, the skeptics are in favor of nuclear power. Um, so, I mean, the skeptics tend to be in favor of cheap energy. And if you, if you don't want millions of third world babies to, be, to die unnecessarily, you have to be in favor of cheap energy. Uh, and cheap energy uh, comes from uh, energy that works, um, that is, nuclear power, first and foremost, and uh, fossil fuels. Now, um, nuclear power is cheap and it's safe, but it's inflexible. So I would say you want about 80% of your output of electricity to come from nuclear and 20% to come from fossil fuels to give you the flexibility. Um, so that would be my view. Uh, now, one of, one of the other paradoxes about the whole debate over global warming is that the measures that people generally propose will not help. And the reason they won't help is because they're not prepared to go after the industrializing countries, notably China and India, who are producing the great majority of CO2 emissions. Uh, the more advanced industrial countries like Western Europe and the United States, they're actually cutting down on their emissions of CO2, because, uh, partly because they're using more natural gas and using fracking and so on, which get more energy per emission of CO2. Um, uh, so, you know, so Obama's war on coal uh, merely had the effect of opening up coal-fired <laughs> plants uh, in China, which are also filthy dirty in terms of sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, and so on, and account for all the smog that you get in Chinese cities. So, uh, but, but the point is that the, the Paris Agreement that uh, our beloved president recently pulled out of, um, was, a, was a, an agreement which let China and India off the hook for several years into the future. And we all know what happens when, those, when we reach that, those years in the future. They'll be let off the hook again. In other words, um, uh, the, the actual tangible measures that people propose uh, to combat global warming, they're not, they're not hitting where it, they ought to. If, if you want to stop, seriously, make a dent in human emissions of CO2, industrial emissions of CO2, what you've got to do is halt economic growth in the third world. You've got to stop dead economic growth in China and India. You've got to condemn those people to a life of village wretchedness and, and uh, destitution indefinitely. That's what you've got to do. Uh, now, people are not prepared to do that. And, and the, of course, the ruling elites in China and India are not prepared to do that anyway. Uh, they know what side their, their bread is buttered. So, so this is, so all, all the political um, uh, posturing about global warming is no more than posturing. It's only if you're really serious, go after India and China. But you'll see, if you do that, you'll quickly become totally irrelevant to politics because no one's going to go after India and China where it comes to measures that would ha hamper their economic growth. Um, <clears throat> now, <clears throat> another paradox about global, war <clears throat> global warming ideology is this. Let's suppose that, let's just say that the percentage of energy <coughs> that's generated by the burning fossil fuels um, is fixed. Let's just say, say that. What follows from that? Well, what follows from that would be that the more you burn fossil fuels now, the less you will have to burn fossil fuels 20, 30, 40, 50 years in the future. Why is that? Because economic, because the biggest variable affecting emissions of carbon dioxide is the population. Economic growth reduces population growth. We are living in a situation where half the world is poor and half the world is rich. The poorer half of the world have babies. The richer half of the world don't have babies. So there's an immigration crisis because people are constantly because the, the richer half of the world would not be able to reproduce itself um, uh, but for immigration. The, po the population would be declining, as it is in places like Japan, that keep out immigrants. Um, so that's the situation. 
what the hope is that we can industrialize the poorer half of the world so that uh, their standard of life is raised to something more comparable to the richer half of the world. That's the hope. Uh, if we can do that, then it's going to bring about a, a huge drop in the world's population. Uh, you know, when people talk about this, they say, oh, by, by um, 2017, the world's population is going to become stationary and then decline. Uh, the, they think of it as a, a gentle decline. It's going to be a catastrophic decline. Uh, um, because if you look at the, the way demographics works, um, that it, it will be, uh, there will be a sharp drop in population if economic growth continues. Um, and I want economic growth to, to continue. I don't want people in the third world to starve. I want them to get better lives like we have in the advanced industrial countries. That is going to cause a reduction, if it happens, it's going to cause, and it is happening, it's going to cause a reduction in population growth and eventually a reduction in population. And that is going to lead to less emissions of carbon dioxide. So that's, uh, that's another paradox. Um, and then my last paradox is this. Um, that people who are members of this pseudo-scientific cult uh, of global warming constantly talk about science as though science is something sacred. But everything they say and do is anti-science. Uh, they think that science means stifling debate. No, science means letting debate flourish. They think that science means persecuting those who have the wrong opinions. No, science means allowing people to express their opinions uh, and seeing which proved to be right in the end. Uh, so that everything that they have, most of them are totally ignorant of science anyway, um, and the, the members of the cult. I mean. Um, and, but they don't seem to see that in worshipping, they don't seem to see that science isn't a priesthood of people who are guaranteed to be right. Science is a method of playing around with ideas, trying out different things, debating, arguing, experimenting. Uh, and of course this is, uh, comes back to what I said at the beginning. Um, the, all the evidence keeps refuting the global warming hypothesis. Uh, and the, and the, the reason that these people are anti-scientific is because they ignore contradictory evidence. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. All right. Who's ever ready with a question? I got the first one. All right. Uh, David, have you taken a look at? We 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 uh, understand that you've taken a look at nuclear power. Do you have any? Are you familiar with the types of reactors or the? Types of things Only that are brought out. Only in broad outline. I mean, have you basically? Uh, okay. Then uh, I know you're a proponent of thorium. Right, mm -hmm. but I mean, what what I'm asking is, have you taken a look at that part of it yourself or not? No, no. I mean, not, like, only what I've read. Uh, okay. You know, superficial. All right. Uh, because I mean, I, I must say, one of the reasons I haven't done more on that is because the ge the general output outlook for nuclear power has uh, over the last 20 30 years has been very bleak yes. you know, um, and um, uh, the, the, it's just this greenest ideology uh, superstitious dread of this wonderful source of energy um, and of course the energy we have is all nuclear I mean the Sun is a great right. fusion reactor uh, and any energy that's in the earth system that doesn't come to the Sun comes from Comes from down now. there, which is a fission reactor. Right. Um, so um, it's all nuclear, um, uh, and um, uh, you know it's um, okay. So yeah. So um, all right. And I guess I don't know much right. about the I don't know much about the current state of the different types of reactors. Thank you. Next question, Charlie. Yes, David. According to your handout. Climate scientists apparently are publishing knowingly false data because they have, quote, a hereditary human need for a righteous cause. Is that me? These are sound academic like me. scientists who are like publishing me. things, and your handout says they are fulfilling a hereditary human need for a righteous cause. Well. I don't remember writing They're that. They're putting their, their career on the line. <laughs> what do you mean putting that career on the line? 
if you if you go out there, you if, you, there if you become a research and scientist and go around, why do you think all these people are blabbing about there's going to be no snow in 10 years? Why do you think these people are blabbing like it is? Because they're being, well, it's because, it's two things. First of all, this is, this is uh, uh, an enthusiastic belief system. But secondly, they're, they're greatly rewarded for this. Trillions of dollars are being thrown at these people. The IPCC really? is this big boondoggle every six years or so. I mean, they, they, these, you, if, you, if you go out and preach this global warming stuff, you, uh, and you've got any credibility, and even in some cases if you don't, uh, if you're like Michael Mann, you have no credibility whatsoever, uh, you're going to be showered with honor and uh, prizes and money. Um, whereas if you're a skeptic, no one's going to give you any money. Uh, you're going to be, you're gonna, uh, that's why most of the skeptics uh, are retired climate scientists. Uh, who, who don't have two, two cents to rub together, uh, and, that, and you know, and and uh, so uh, <clears throat> look, there's two things going on here. Uh, there is. Uh, yeah, there there is. There, the, is, there, is, like it there is. There is. The, there is. First of all, there is the power <laughs> of belief systems. Um, people have a need to believe in a system of ideas. Hereditary human uh, need. And but then there is money. Uh, th so those are two things. They're both, they're both influential. Uh, and and the, they, both com they both combine. Uh, but you, will, I think, I, I predict that we that we will live to see the end of this. I predict that we will live. Even you and I will live to see the point where everybody looks back on this and says, "What a lot of nonsense that was." <laughs> that will happen. All right. Run away greenhouse. Jonathan. Let's go, Mr. Jonathan. David, uh, the industrialized countries in the world that most invest in math and science in their curriculum from K through 12 in college uh, also uh, highly invest in renewable energy, comparably budget-wise to the United States. Uh, and they have a lower military budget. Now, I want to ask you a neutral, independent question uh, where we can find middle ground we have an uh, EPA head right now in the United States government named Scott Pruitt, who is one of the most uneducated on math and sciences people we've ever had in a cabinet position. He also happens to be very pro-militarism. Would you agree that no matter what we think is the solution to the climate change crisis, uh, whenever we have a militarist saying they know the solution, it's always going to turn out bad, even if they have a right solution, we're still going to end up on a planet that we cleaned up and made healthy to live on, a place where we all have wars anyway. So I'm, I'm interested in your take on Scott Pruitt as possibly a non-starter for anything constructive in government. Well, I, I mean, I've read a few things about Scott Pruitt, but I haven't, this is the first time I've heard that he was particularly militaristic. I didn't know that. The entire Trump administration has been on record as vetted as being pro whatever well, I think, the military I'm sure he believes aggressive in, spending and aggressive I'm sure he believes military. in national defense and something. But, uh, well, they say national defense, but they really mean global hegemony. Well, I that's, mean, that's, that's, something, that's, okay. something, that, that's something that every U.S. administration has believed in since Eisenhower. Fair enough, fair enough. I mean, that really, I mean, Obama believed in global hegemony. Fair enough. Um, uh, and, and, and believe me, uh, one of the things that most worried me, but before the election, I was inclined to favor Hillary Clinton as the lesser of two evils. But the one thing that most worried me about her was this uh, warmongering stuff. And now I find that Trump... The one promise that he completely breaks immediately is the woman is like Hillary on the warmonger and stuff. I mean, uh, it, it's it's it's, uh, it, it's just appalling. Uh, so um, it you seems know, like they're on a race to either make us extinct through war or make well, us extinct through climate change, and it's right. like both are equally prob problematic. I think, I think I think there is something that there's an interaction of psychology and politics that is very interesting. That somebody. A, a president or some other person in, the, in history uh, you know, on this world stage, um, everybody sort of yeah. can have all kinds of criticisms, but he's very unimpressed. And then, it, then he goes and murders a few people, and everybody's oh, he's not so bad. <laughs> and and uh, you know, when when Trump bombed Syria uh, in response to a gas attack that obviously was imaginary and never happened, 
Um, and everybody be began to relax a bit and say, oh, he's not such a maniac as we thought. He knows how to, how to commit mass murder. That's uh, what a good guy. No, I mean, I, th I think it's terrible. Um, uh, but, um, you know, um, of course, you know, in the election campaign, Trump was very much against unnecessary wars. And he, he, the logic of what he said would rule out staying in Afghanistan, would rule out doing anything in Syria. Uh, you see, you, some of the others you might argue there was very uh, urgent U.S. interests involved, but um, but in those two cases, clear the Trump in, Trump in the election should have said we're out of there. Uh, but um, I don't, you know, I don't know how, how, to, how to explain it. Thank you for your answer, uh, David. Um, you claim that uh, nuclear is safe. So what do you have to say about Three Mile Island, Fukushima, and Chernobyl? I'm old enough to, re I'm old enough to remember the joke that more people died at Chappaquiddick than died at Three Mile Island. Um, <laughs> nobody died at Three Mile Island. Well, OK, let's take the other two. Take the other two, then. Right. I mean, but you, know, you have to understand, look, um, large-scale industry, you sometimes have accidents. Uh, you sometimes have accidents due to incompetence. Uh, but if you're, if you're handling huge amounts of energy, if you're handling huge amounts of um, explosive raw materials or whatever, you know, the, 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 there have been chemical plants that have had terrible accidents oh, yeah. that killed thousands of people. Um, uh, I mean, obviously, you want to arrange things so that the accidents don't happen, and I'm in favor of measures to make sure the accidents don't happen, but there are going to be some accidents. Uh, I don't think the, nu the nuclear are not Certainly not among, I mean, it has a better safety record than most industries. Yeah, really um, good. <laughs> and, um, uh, you know, um, so, uh, I mean, the number of, I mean, how many people, how many uh, people die because of these windmills that are oh, yeah. 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 cluttering up the landscape? Not to mention all the birds and bats that they kill every day. Well, I don't think I like this. Over here. You know, I read this article you handed out about the Arctic fallacy. Right. And what it's saying is that polar bears are not dying because of a lack of ice. That they've lived with that before. Right. And, but it's also saying that the ice is melting. Right. It has, well, there has been some reduction over. Uh, it stopped now, but I mean, until very recently, there had been a reduction in so, Arctic ice and a, a corresponding increase in Antarctic ice. This article is saying that the Arctic ice is melting in the summer, yeah, coming back. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sounds like global warming. Well, I mean, look, it's you can take it as red. No one's going to dispute that there has been about one degree Celsius increasing global temperatures over the past 170 years. And it's going to have some consequences. It's going to lead to, um, a, presumably, other things being equal. It's going to lead to a reduction in ice. It's going to lead to uh, rising sea levels. It's going to lead to all kinds of things. Um, but that's not in dispute. Um, and presumably, in the Little Ice, I mean, well, not just presumably, we know in the Little Ice Age, the amount of uh, Arctic ice grew tremendously. We know that partly because when the, shortly after the Vikings arrived in Greenland, they could sail all the way around the north of Greenland. It was free of ice, and they mapped it. Um, uh, they can't do that today. It hasn't got back to that point. Okay, you're next, David. Uh, in there, you know, um, I, I, shouldn't we be siding on the uh, side of being on the side of caution? We're talking about potentially uh, a huge catastrophe if all this stuff is true. Um, like, don't ask the people in India if they wanted it hotter, or people in Africa. Uh, shouldn't we be erring on the side of caution uh, as we burn trillions of gallons of gasoline, trillions of gallons of jet fuel, trillions of gallons of oil going in the future? I think um, people are hacks if they say it's true or untrue. I don't know if it's true or untrue, and I don't think anybody really knows for a bit. It's so far into the future. It's decades and decades and decades into the future. In fact, they've been talking about climate change or global warming for three or four decades in the past. 
So should we be uh, siding, uh, bearing on the side of caution somewhat, or do we just let big oil take over and burn, burn, baby, burn? Well, I, I would favor, first of all, I would favor nuclear power for the great majority of energy. You can't run jet aircraft and get cars um, so, and so, on nuclear. Uh, it doesn't work. <laughs> oh, it's cheaper than other cheaper than other forms of energy. But uh, but anyway, look. Uh, so you have to keep you have to keep this in you have to keep this in perspective, right? Um, first of all, one thing you have to understand about warming. Whenever the whenever the Earth warms, whenever uh, global surface temperature, average global surface temperature increases, the the increase in temperature is always, it's nearly always, and certainly it is now, greatest away from the equator. The, in other words, um, I mean, they're already having record temperatures. Heat, in the uh, heat energy is getting from the equator to the higher latitudes. I'm talking about the northern hemisphere because that's where yeah, most, of the, most of the land is. Um, and um, so when we talk, when we, you have to understand that when we say global warming, what we're talking about is less cold winter nights away from the equator, near the poles. Right? That's what we're talking about. Uh, we're not talking that if, if, if you, even if you live through the ice, the, the glaciation that, that prevailed until 13,000 years ago, if you live near the equator, you wouldn't notice the climate change. These, the, near the equator, the climate doesn't change through all these fluctuations. We've got millions of cars now. And What's that? We've got millions and millions of air carriers. Right, but I mean, you're talking about people in Africa and India. I'm just making the point that it's the colder areas of the Earth which, where most global warming takes place. Yeah, we want that. Um, We're all so so that's, one th that's one thing you have to understand. Thank you, honey. The other thing you have to understand is this, that um, every living thing that respires Change? No. That means every living thing emits carbon dioxide. Yeah, I've heard that argument. Um, and um, there's, there is the carbon cycle is constantly going on. Uh, and the other, another thing you have to understand is that plants absolutely need carbon dioxide, even though, oh, yeah. even though it's such. Okay, can, can I just have no interruptions until I finish? Yeah, let, let me get two or three sentences out, and it will, it will go much better. Um, uh, plants need carbon dioxide, even though there's a very tiny amount of carbon dioxide, they absolutely need it. And in fact, before this recent increase in carbon dioxide, we were getting dangerously close to the point where plant life would die on this planet, because they wouldn't have enough <coughs> carbon dioxide. So we're very fortunate that the oil company, Big Oil, started um, burning all this producing all this carbon dioxide. Uh, yes, uh, can glaciation occur in a person's refrigerator? Yes. Is that a trick question? I had one of those. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a serious Just question? Just give me a yes or no answer. Uh, yes. Next question. You have. Um, if you uh, Google William Redmond, uh, he examined cores from Antarctica and he showed that global warming actually started 8,000 years ago when uh, human beings began to cut forests and burn the wood and um, that um, the fluctuations that led to uh, ice ages versus warming periods were much reduced uh, starting about 8,000 years ago. And um, uh, the, he came to this conclusion by examining ice cores from Antarctica. And um, so the CO2 in the atmosphere has been building up for 8,000 years, basically. And um, the amount that we're putting in now um, hasn't reached the, a doubling of what had happened in the previous 7,500 years. So, um, it's a really big problem. I, I just have many, many, many questions about the things that you've been saying, but I did want to make the point that you should, you should look up William Rudiman and his work. How do you spell it? R-U-D-D-I-M-A-N. R-U-D-D-I-M-A-N. 
Well, I mean, the obvious response to that is that um, human beings burning trees 8,000 years ago, if you're talking about a carbon dioxide effect, that would be so tiny compared with the carbon cycle that it's difficult to see how it could possibly have much uh, perceptible effect. But I will read what he says. Bit, but, uh, Next question, Raj, over here. I'm, I'm really confused. Are you objecting the scientific methodology? Or are you questioning the results they are coming out with? Yes. Or the knowledge base they have? What are you questioning? Well, the, the, the results they're coming out with are due to computer simulations, not observations. And that's, I'm not joking when I say they're allergic to the reality. Okay. Over here. Yeah, the over here. And, uh, yeah. um, Back to his kind of question, something along what he was saying. You know, you started to talk talking about um, the failures of science with respect with respect to meat, with respect to fats, and then we have the thing with tobacco, and then we have like we have climate. So. Is it, do you not think that it's possible to use science to understand the, the atmosphere, the climate, the atmosphere? Do you think science, whether it's fats, animal fats, tobacco, diet, that is just something we should not believe in because it's always manipulated wrong and goes to the highest bidder? Well, uh, look, the main, the main, I don't know exactly where this question is coming from, but there may be a mis misconception here. Um, there are hundreds of skeptical climate scientists who do work that is obviously relevant to this debate over global warming. Uh, so, you know, um, uh, Judith Curry, who is a, an eminent climate scientist who's done a lot of work on the, um, the, uh, the Pacific decadal oscillation and the, and the um, Atlantic multidecadal oscillation, because climate is involved with ocean currents. So, um, I mean, she, a lot of her work, it doesn't, she's a skeptic, complete skeptic, um, just as much as I am. But she doesn't, her published papers are mainly not about an issue that directly bears upon it. And there's a whole area of climate science that does not directly bear upon this, this disagreement about global warming. So, so um, you know, there's, uh, <clears throat> that, 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 that's my answer to that. I mean, obviously, science should study the, the climate. Charlie, we got time for a couple more questions and we'll go to rebuttal. All right. Why is it so difficult for the libertarians to admit the Greens are correct and they've been verified by the scientific community? What is the issue with you guys? What is the problem? Does the problem, it is, Wall Street. The problem is the Greens are right? full of it. That's the problem. Does it much that you're wrong? How about it's still wrong, I Charlie? I could be wrong, but you, you will live to see. Right. You will live to see that you have been wrong. Yes. <laughs> so yes. Oh, yes. Yes. All right. All right. Okay. Now we enter what should be the famous rebuttal right. period. All right. All right. Everybody oh. has a rebuttal. Yes. yes. Uh, let's have a show of hands. See who wants to give a rebuttal tonight. One, two, three. Keep your hands up. Four, five. Six. Charlie, you going to give a rebuttal? Uh -huh. Don't forget to mention Thorium. Of course. Of course. You can't run cars and airplanes on Thorium. We we'll we'll do the usual four minutes. Four minutes. Four minutes. Four minutes. Okay. Four minutes. 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 Four Give me a chance to rebut. Okay, let's go. Yes, I'm sorry. My apologies. I had uh, uh, at least three points of rebuttal. Um, the first one is the vocabulary and the um, uh, way that uh, Mr. Steele talked. Uh, he never mentioned global warming uh, scientists with any other adjective than the pseudoscientific cult. And uh, this was a, a really um, linguistic trick to try to uh, disprove or dis 
disrespect them. And uh, at one point he called them idiots, which I think is uh, really uh, argue, uh, really works against his argument to characterize his uh, opponents that way. And um, and then the proofs of um, the the the, the, I, uh, the the proofs of not global warming that he mentioned, for example, hurricanes being fewer. But hurricanes are stronger, and the fewer and stronger storms, the fewer and stronger uh, weather patterns are proofs of global warming, not uh, proofs of not global warming. Because the more extreme weather events, they may be fewer hurricanes, but they are much stronger than in the past. And in our memories, we know that uh, a slow hurricane is much more damaging than a fast hurricane, like the one that uh, squatted over in Honduras about five years ago. I can't remember the name. Um, and um, then um, this business about uh, Lamarck and uh, the inheritance of acquired characteristics you know, I, I went to school and oh, I studied no, no, the Mark and uh, Lysenko, Lysenko, not the Mark. And uh, Lysenko was obviously, uh, he was supported by the Soviet Union and he predict and he Sorry. talked about the inheritance of acquired characteristics because that's what Stalin wanted. But now there's epigenetics and epigenetics is showing that we can inherit acquired characteristics because the uh, uh, the the um, ambience around the DNA changes, and this ambience goes with the DNA as it moves through the generations, and so the ambience can be acquired, and it's not the DNA, but it is an acquired characteristic that is passed on in inheritance. Um, and then I I had to laugh at um, uh, Mr. Steel. It's Ramsey Steel. Yes, um, laughing at other people's predictions, and then he comes up with things like um, the U.S. will be like Greenland, and uh, this cannot be stopped. China and India will uh, always be let off the hook as uh, because they are producing more CO2 than anybody else, which I disagree with, because one third of the CO2 that is produced in China is produced making stuff that they sell in the United States and we buy it and but then China gets the opposite of credit for producing the CO2 and we're the ones who are buying the products that are produced. Um, and then the catastrophic decline in population. Um, this, is a, this is a prediction that, um, that seems to me just as extreme as anybody else's prediction. Okay, I'm going to go next. All right, before we go on any further, I have no, no problems with David Ramsey Steele's argument about the nuclear power and its way we're going to have to do things. The problem is today, the way we are doing nuclear power with the current light water reactor is not the best way to do nuclear power. It does have a lot of waste. It does have a lot of stuff on it. But what we need to do is come up with a safer, better alternative to nuclear power. And you've heard me speak about it before in the form of the thorium molten salt reactor. Every, uh, well, Charlie, you've heard me speak about this before. And I'm, the more I learn, the more I'm becoming more firm, permanent and my firmament of beliefs about a safe form of a rea reactor. The thing is, the one thing that most nuclear reactors and nuclear accidents have is because a light water reactor runs at above atmospheric pressure. What you need is something that is in a liquid state that runs at atmospheric pressure, and you eliminate the chance for intermixing. If you use things like thorium and, and other things in the reactor itself and in the uh, liquefied state, it takes about 400 degrees for that liquid to circulate. When it starts cooling down, it solidifies. 
goes into a drain tank and it's safe. Plus that stuff doesn't mix with the environment and it doesn't melt down because it wants to solidify. In other words, to keep a thorium reactor running in its liquid state, even one with fuel with uranium, you have to keep the reaction going rather than keeping it from getting out of control. Now, with the widespread deployment of these reactors, and we built them in the past, there was one in the 1960s that ran for 6,000 hours at Oak Ridge Laboratories from a gentleman by the name of Dr. His name was Daniel Weinberg, who was a director of it. And a lot of the, you can still see a lot of the scientific papers on the thorium reactor from the energy from thorium site that he set up. It's all there available on PDFs. About 30% of his work is in there. The rest is still waiting to be downloaded, but still at the archives in um, his laboratory in, in Oak Ridge. The thing is, the link between electricity and prosperity has been well established for many, many years. And the better we can generate electricity, the better off mankind is going to be in uh, getting industrialized. The Central Intelligence Agency says about $8,000 is needed to dramatically affect the birth rate and the rates of, of population going down. And the reason for that is relatively simple. When you get above $8,000, kids become more of an, a liability than an asset. You have less of them because it costs a lot more to raise them than it would in a non-industrialized society where they're viewed as a source of labor and as a source of retirement. We all love kids. We would like two or three of them, maybe one, two, whatever, but to have five or six, it's a little expensive these days. To honestly get to our climate problem, I think we would all like to be off oil. And during the brief 20 to 30 year period that nuclear reactors were under construction, even though they were not of even though they were not of what we call the right design, but they were light water, we still were able to get close to, I think, about a third of our electric power from non-fossil fuel sources. The waste that we talk about, if you look at it volumetrically, can be handled. And a lot of it can be recycled into new fuel. That's what they don't tell you. Thank you. Yeah, but you can't use any cars and planes. Yes, oil is a problem. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Raj. Raj has got Raj has got something to say. My name is My name is Raj Patel, and uh, talking about India and China and energy. One of my neighbor has a ten kids, and I'm single. I'm single person. So I go and tell that my neighbor keeps ten times more water. You so each ten times more food. You know, it's not saying anything. Okay? India, per capita consumption of energy in India is very, very low. China is very, very low. If there is same consumption per person, then India will be booming, China will be booming. Secondly, science has brought us a long way. And scientific methodology has been improving ever since. However, it is clear that conclusion reached today may be changed in times to come with more information and more knowledge about current identity, getting the information. As far as interpretation concerned, if you do not use scientific in scientific knowledge to judge a data, what do you judge it on? You talk about, uh, I think you have a problem with the complexity. You are talking about sun and sun rays and everything. And it's a complex subject, I agree. Okay? But how do you reach a conclusion in such a complex subject? I think scientific, scientists are doing a good job and they are coming with a good conclusion. Now, will it always be valid? No, probably not. But uh, it's just like a president. We have one president and we go, go we have to go with what they eat. Scientists decide un until they come up with a new conclusion, or you come up with a new conclusion, or new analysis, we say that no, Mr. X is wrong and you are right. 
but there is no scientific journal sare all about that was the science scientific compulsion symposium and all the they get together and talk about that's all about is about and so after you go through those things after you go through peer reviews then you have to you have to rely on whatever you have and it's and those, those things if a scientist can take a take a little little um, little uh, gadget from here and, a, and a put on a mars and a spot they say they will put on then i can believe it they know they can do that so that is reality okay and if you the what is happening is that non scientific the again science people they are talking about like a reading from a bible bible says so so i believe it and you might have a different bible or different thing reality is that we have to accept the science otherwise we cannot we conduct we cannot conduct business we cannot conduct industry we cannot do anything as far as global warming is concerned i think uh, it is in the hands of business it is in the hands of the industry and they are taking the balls and going ahead and i don't think rest of the society do not they don't talk much about it it still will go on because because business business are there investment are there and they think it's good for them and it's going to work but uh, i don't know i don't know this this uh, i think i think it, again i want to say that you have problems finding a arriving at a conclusion from a complexity of the of the research and a complexity of the information received and we have a lots of field we have that problem we have problem with the government you know we have problem with lots of statistics and everything we are not able to come to a right conclusion thank you All right. All right. He told you. All right. Roger's got ties for sale. He told you. Roger's got ties for free. He's looking to. For free? Yes. Oh, he told me. Um, one thing I'd like to agree with the speaker on is uh, I think that it's uh, that sometimes science is uh, worshipped too much and there's oh, not yeah. enough critical thinking. Uh, it made me think of an example. Uh, That was very upsetting to me when I heard about it in the news. Uh, there was a big push uh, by scientists, uh, by the furniture industry and the chemical industry, supported by scientists, to add fire retardant chemicals to furniture, basic furniture and mattresses, um, with the argument that it worked and uh, and it was necessary and that the chemicals were not dangerous to people and it turns out the exact opposite the chemicals don't work at all and they are very dangerous to people so we have people who are using the furniture and sleeping on the furniture and they're exposed to these incredibly harmful chemicals so um i i just agree with the speaker that it it's good In science, there needs to be a discussion, and you need to open for to be open to criticism. And and there, are, I believe, there are people in the process who are uh, who can be biased. So uh, on a on another thing that he said, um, uh, he talked about um, that uh, nuclear power is cheap, and um, and I guess the way the accountants work it. It, it is cheap, but in, in any kind of business model, you're going to basically look at costs and expenses and weigh the two, and then you basically bill your customers accordingly. Um, the problem with the nuclear industry is that they get lucky and they're leaving out a cost. Um, uh, it, it, it's, Kind of uh, an aside that's actually related. I had a rental space once for storage, and it cost me about 50 bucks a month. Now they're probably 100 bucks a month for just little like 10 by 10 space, which is like 1,200 bucks a year. Well, imagine storing all the waste nuclear stuff for 100,000 years. Maybe multiply that, and then add in security. That cost is not passed on. To the consumer, what they do is they say, uh, "We're just going to not talk about it, and then we'll just build future generations." 
what happens in a thousand years if there is somebody who just wants to wash their hands of it? This is going to be insanely expensive to store and to guard for 100,000 years. And that isn't reflected in the actual cost of using this energy that we get. So I just think it's incredibly disingenuous to say that Sorry. nuclear energy is cheap because I just I just can't imagine planning 100,000 years to make sure that this is safely stored. And the, the other problem is where do you store it? Because right now, every, the whole United States is ganging up on Nevada. They all want to say, oh yeah, we all vote to put it in Nevada. Yeah. Nevada doesn't want it. You know why? They don't, they don't use nuclear power. The other problem is uh, the, uh, the Yucca Mountains are, uh, they're showing uh, geographic, uh, uh, geologic instability. So, so they're actually making the argument that it's a, not a safe place to put it, but the problem is that Illinois is just not going to allow it, a long-term storage facility here. And Illinois has more reactors than anywhere else. And so um, I think there's a host of problems with the nuclear uh, alternative to fossil fuels. Thank you. Well, uh, I, I was disappointed in the talk. Um, like the lady said, you know, the outrageous arguments he made, of, not arguments, statements of you know, Chicago being buried under a mile of ice, etc., the people dying by the hundreds of millions, um, are just the mirror side of the of the other it's, you know, it's just the same thing over and over again. The question that I brought up about science and um, the the way the cigarettes were treated, the way, like the gentleman just said about the uh, furniture retard, uh, the way um, fats were treated, the way margarine was treated, butter was treated, lead and lead and gasoline, um, just the things that I know off off the top of my head. It's, it's just just a can of worms. Uh, the thing about the Earth's climate is is just a moving target. It's like, first of all, if you go back a long, long time, you're going to find that the continents are in different places. The Earth, the Earth's mass is in different places. The reflection and all of that other stuff is in different places. You have to realize that the Earth's bio influences the composition of the atmosphere, which influences the climate. For example, uh, there was a time when there was a lot more CO2 in the atmosphere. And that CO2 was sequestered by animals that make shells in the oceans. And those shells were deposited. And then there was a terrific, like, I would call it an earthquake. And we have the white cliffs of Dover, which are just chalk. That chalk just didn't fall out of the sky. It was a living biological process that took carbon and sequestered it. And once that happened, like, you know, there was room for other animals on the Earth. The Earth has been through an awful lot. What I don't understand about the Earth is how over, let's say, the last billion years, it has stayed within a very narrow temperature range. I have no idea how that happens. You would think it would run away one way or the other, you know? But to stay in a narrow temperature range means to me that there's a feedback loop that when the Earth warms up, there's some unknown feedback loop that tends to cool it. And when the Earth cools down, there's another one that tends to warm it because it's unnatural for it to stay within a narrow, very narrow range over, over just the last billion years, okay? Um, now, the other thing I'd like to say is that I find it insulting that people would agree, would observe that ice is melting, sea level is rising, Miami during, flood, during full moons during, has like water backing up the sewers and onto the streets, that and contrary to what the speaker said about no hurricanes from 2005 to 2015, 
we had Hurricane Sandy in New York in 2012 that just demolished New Jersey and New York, that um, um, that people find it in, like for the first time impossible to do something. It's like, oh, we can't do something. It's only carbon. It's the little tiny percentage of the atmosphere. Whereas if you get bitten by a snake that just ins inserts a little tiny percentage of your body weight of a toxin, it'll kill you. You know? I just find that we know there's a problem, we've observed there's a problem, we don't know why there's a problem, and we refuse to tackle it. It's like, what? It's goofy. Um, for example, decades ago in the 1700s, someone observed that milkmaids did not get smallpox. And they figured it was because of cowpox that they were exposed to. They didn't know how it worked, they didn't know about germs, they didn't know anything, but they took care of it and voila, we have a vaccine. It's just amazing that people see a problem and just don't want to do anything about what they observe. Well, thank you. Okay. Um, Introduce yourself. I'm Rick Stuckey. Um, retired information technology consultant, um, and now more, more involved with the environment than anything else. Um, we heard about paradoxes. It seems to me one of the biggest paradoxes that we heard in the presentation is that climate change is not real and not caused by human beings in carbon dioxide to a great extent at all, but yet we have to power 80% of our electricity from nuclear, so we cut down the CO2. Something doesn't quite match there. Okay, now, renewables are now, at the present moment, I mean solar and um, photovoltaic, are by far the cheapest source of electricity, uns unsubsidized. You, go, you put your bids out now and you will find the cheapest response you get comes from the renewable industry. Now, there are, the, the, the Achilles heel of the renewable industry is that it is somewhat intermittent. It is the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine. But if you offset them, sun and, sun and the wind are typically happen at different peak periods, so they do offset somewhat. If you connect enough places together, the wind is blowing somewhere, and you can get, come around. But the, the weak part is we currently haven't got really economical storage. If we have a little bit more capability in storage, and it won't be by <laughs> lots of D-cell batteries, which is what we're hooking around with now. But other forms of storage, like hydrogen, for example, mm -hmm. some people are working on, night, on, on ammonia storage. There are various other techniques that are being investigated. There's a very big project going on with Argon Labs 555 right. to uh, vastly improve uh, the forms of batteries. And uh, considering how fast the solar prices are coming down, the power storage is also coming down at a very rapid level. So we don't need to have the, the nuclear. We can do perfectly well without it. And nuclear is the most expensive source of electricity, bar none, and it will not be built by private sources at all. No private company is prepared to put its money behind building a, a nuclear power station without government subsidies. The government subsidies to the present nuclear industry are absolutely massive, starting off with free extraction of the uranium, the, the refinement of the uranium, the uh, removal of the waste product, all hidden costs that we are absorbing, and it's still, even with the subsidies and so on, chart costing 10 to 20 cents per kilowatt hour at least, whereas we can get our renewables at 3 cents a kilowatt hour. So it's the most expensive interest we've ever invented, and it is completely unnecessary. So that that's, uh, um, I think, a fairly strong argument yeah. in favor of, 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 of working super hard on putting that same money that's going to waste on fighting wars caused increasingly by climate change, as in Syria, where the migration of people away from, this, from the farmland that was no longer farmable into the cities is what caused the problems. Now imagine what's going to happen in Bangladesh, which is almost all at sea level at the present moment, or underneath it, when 20 million people or more start moving into the territories that somebody else has, because they have nowhere else to go because the water levels come up. Is that going to cause friction? Is that going to cause our future nuclear wars and so on? 
Are we going to need a bigger defense department because we are cool, uh, heating the atmosphere up no end? Uh, there's all sorts of problems that are going to come about just because climate change is real and it's happening and it's happening increasingly fast. Yes, there are certainly some examples where people have missed their predictions, but hell, there's an awful lot more when they've been underestimating the problems, not under overestimating, and when they're finding them, they've, they've missed things that are making the climate change far, far worse. They have not included, for example, the positive feedback loops of methane coming from the permafrost. Right. Methane coming from the permafrost, 87, 87 times more effective as a climate change gas than carbon dioxide, at least in the short term, uh, will heat up the atmosphere, which will cause more heating, more, more methane to be released, which is a, a positive feedback loop. The, the melting of the Arctic ice, which is clearly happening, because we're now bringing ships all the way through the Arctic, um, is, uh, is reducing the amount of reflection of the sun from the Arctic, which is then causing more heating and therefore more melting of the ice. So we're definitely in positive feedback loops. We're also in, uh, getting not that far away from changing the ocean currents, which currently circulate the uh, heat around the globe. If those ocean currents change, we haven't a clue how to get anything back again. So a lot of these things are approaching a tipping point, and we badly need to do things to, uh, to eliminate the CO2 and other gases going into the atmosphere. It can be done, we just don't have the will to do it. And a large reason we don't is because the fossil fuel industry is lying through their teeth about the cause of the problems, and they are funding the government, particularly people like Trump and yeah. Trump, to keep the old ways going so they can keep on making their massive profits. Yes. So kick the bastards out. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Jonathan. Yeah. Uh, thank you, David Swamp, for an interesting talk. I don't have four minutes to uh, give what I feel about the talk, but coincidentally, if I had a whole hour, you could go to collegeofcomplexes.org to last year's uh, July presentation, Happy Birthday, Henry, and I think it would be appropriate if you watched that to get a feeling of what my rebuttal might be if I had unlimited time. So seeing that I can't give a rebuttal on the talk exactly, uh, David, when is your birthday, if I may? And social. When is my birthday? What month? You don't have to tell me what exact date. June. June? Very good. June. So it's this one. So I have a... It's the most popular month to be born. Yes, it is. And that's why you're my favorite speaker at the College of Congress. I have a book by Naomi Klein about climate called This Changes Everything, Capitalism versus Climate. I would like to present to you as a birthday gift this oh, evening. Okay. And I have I the DVD movie, This Changes Everything, by Naomi Klein, also companion pieces of birthday gift. Happy birthday, David. So assuming that I still have time to read a birthday poem, I would also like to read a birthday poem. And I really liked your talk. I wouldn't necessarily say I agree with anything in it, but I like it. <laughs> Just like a leaf of a branch reaching out over the river, lives not in waves or the land, even clouds free of all other. Just like a leaf on a branch reaching out over the water, in the middle of a path, neither bound by sun nor anchor. Like a leaf of a river islet in the most precious second ever. The will achieved, somehow we wish to be, sometimes feel just that raw, just that strong, ready all of dreamer green, gone further into the spiritual hours, reaching out over forever just like a leaf. Song major awed by natural power, free over forever just like a leaf, a leaf on a river islet in the most precious second ever. The will to sometimes we, fitting to be, sometimes feel, all out, that about, ready now, a self-taught study, Gone forever into the spiritual hours, reaching out over further, just like a leaf. Soul major, awed by natural power, free over all answers, yes, like a leaf. With the will to be, it reminds us all are one who fight for we. With the will to be, it reminds us all we must fearlessly, for the most precious second ever. Just like a leaf on a branch, reaching out over forever. In our soul prints, in our song steps, ever found in past and future. Just like a leaf of a branch, reaching out over the river. Lives not in waves or the land, even clouds free of all other. Just like a leaf on a branch, reaching out over the water. In the midst of the path, neither bound by sun nor anchor. We the people are a leaf of a river islet at the most unprecedented era ever. So clear a path to the light of the burning stars. Be just who I am, you be just who you are. 
I hear a class taught a way of speech harm. There's nothing new the system can teach to the scar. Clear a peace to the love of beautiful afar. I'm just who I am. Are you just who you are? I read a math law, a heart beloved particle. There's something now we can free from those chains and bars. Because we are lifeboats, it's love we keep afloat. We are lifeboats, it's enough to keep us going. Labor of love and so keep our hearts in tune with our souls. Labor of love we know dream beneath the stars, light can't be owned. We are our mind's wild growth and open to the road. We are our minds of hope, heal a wound in the toast. We are our rising folk, the street is built of poems. We are arriving angels and the sky cries, don't leave me here alone. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. All right. I'm sick of this Reaganomic stuff in Ronald Reagan. He taught us to hate everything government. So let's put lead back into gasoline. Because uh, it's science that got it out. Who here knows what can be take what's taken out of air pollution when you when you have a catalytic converter on a car? Okay, only one thing, two things. Carbon monoxide and unburned hydrocarbons. When you burn fossil fuels, you got sulfur dioxide. You got carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, nitrogen oxides, volatile compounds, particulates, big and small, ozone, okay, heavy metals, carbon, Catalytic converters only get out the carbon monoxide. All right, so you know this climate change, it was a lefty thing, and Gore's kind of an idiot because he's not a scientist, but Gore is Gore and he gets publicity. But anyway, it's fun to see how the right-wingers uh, turned this uh, climate change thing and made a big thing about it. Uh, and you know, nobody can say for sure what's going to happen in the future. I mean, this is, there's billions of cars, there's billions of airplanes that are going to be burning oil for centuries. You know, it's in the future. And then meanwhile, we're, you know, do you realize 7 million people die every year in the world from air pollution? Yes. Those other eight things I explained besides carbon dioxide? Which would be a much cleaner world if we had thorium reactors. Tim, you're number three on the list for that. <laughs> okay, for the last time, oil is for transportation. Okay, big old fat airplanes that have no emissions controls whatsoever, never will have emissions controls, and then cars with their little catalytic converters. So you make carbon neutral fuels from this extra heat that the reactors produce? Okay, we'll yeah, work on that. You cannot use thorium for transportation, period. <laughs> okay, let me get to my last three things. So I need you so we won't hear about thorium ever again from you, right? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> um, let's see, what are the right wing Wall Street stuff? You know, what do you call all the psycho left wingers? <laughs> climate scientists. <laughs> you know, there's you know, 10,000, 100,000 scientists on, on the left wing that actually make some somewhat decent points. I don't go either way on climate change. I never bring it up. I just bring up old fashioned air pollution. <laughs> That's it. Uh, that'll kill you <laughs> right away. But you know, you bring up psycho quotes from psycho left wingers. It's as, almost as bad as nut job right wing radio. WCBK you know, you know, that's that's who supports uh, you know the the right wing nut jobs on climate change. They also have the left wing left wing nut jobs on CPT too. Yeah, there's left wing nut jobs. I'm an equal opportunity hater. <laughs> okay, do you know that Europe has as many people as the United States, more or less? and they burn half as much oil. That's because they've been a particularly at civil war for the last 500 years and don't know how to keep the peace. They're Who closer, agrees with Tim? Closer together. No, I don't no, agree. No, it has nothing to do with density. No. They have more superior trans technology and transportation that systems. They do. Because of the right. density. Yes. No, no, there's as much land in Europe. Okay, nobody lives between the Mississippi and the West Coast. Nobody. Okay, Denver. <laughs> okay. California. 
I said West Coast. We don't care about the West Coast personally. Okay, so, so immigrants. Speaker finish, please. Europe uses half the oil per capita in aggregate, what have you. They have superior transportation systems, bullet trains, transit, name it. And so are some of the... Sorry. That's okay. I enjoy your accent as much as him. And anyway, so the, the, the whole way to solve this is instead of gas guzzling SUVs and gas guzzling European planes, is start building technology and transportation systems. One more thing and then I'll get out of here. Did I trace Ronald Reagan and Wall Street yet? Yes, yes you, you have. have. Get out of here. Bless your heart for doing so. Get out of here. <laughs> Did I tra tra trash the right wing nut job? Yeah, I did. <laughs> All, right. Yep, All right, Charlie, you're up. <laughs> All right, let's thank our speaker for a nice, thoughtful presentation. All right. And the handouts. And Charlie, I'm good seeing you again. All right, I'll be eclectic as usual here. Um, I've never completely understood why the libertarians or the conservatives are opposed to the Greens. When I first saw my article, I didn't fully understand it. I go, why would anybody be opposed to ecological issues? And I mean, honestly, from England, I keep thinking about this. We've all seen photos of, of a foggy night in London town. But it wasn't fog; it was coal smoke. <laughs> that and and wouldn't you like it better when it's clear? The air is clean and clear. I don't fully understand the position here, but I guess perhaps it's free market capitalism and it interferes with the profit thing. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple things here. Uh, first of all, uh, this thing about radiation. Uh, I, you know, Fukushima, he's like, well, Brady, he wanted to advocate nuclear reactors. They're having tours of Fukushima. The only thing is they tell you if you take the tour, do not touch anything. <laughs> do not pick up anything. And under no circumstances, take something with you after the tour <laughs> out of there. Now, you're saying we should replicate this situation like this a multitude of times um, across the no. world and I must uh, draw the line. Now the other thing is the, 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 the thorium guys, I happen to notice this and this always bothered me. They had a real issue when it came to discussing radiation and they tried to say that radiation didn't exist or it wasn't harmful. And yeah, if you read the, some of the things I'm going, radiation is very harmful. There's no dispute about that. And you know, that's, I think that's, if you want, the one thing that, you know, it, it's a radioactive process yep. and you're in that family and you're not going to separate yourself from that. I, any effort, it's an indication and an effort to distance yourself from the other uh, radioactive, radioactive activities. And I don't think you are totally separate. And that was, to me, was an indication of what it was. I've heard some talk here tonight, a little bit, what you're talking about are, are government, there's government and industry standards and regulations. The current administration is trying to dismantle the regulatory apparatus of the United States government. You talk about a bias, where's the guy about some hazardous beds or something like that. There, I even I published a book on this matter of fact, and then just sometimes the government doesn't do standards of everything. It just doesn't have that much, that, that much, uh, uh, that it can engage in, that every single item or activity is undergone and tested for personal safety to simply be on the means. Uh, but there are industry and standards most of the time. Actually enough, the government will accept an association or an industry standard. And there's no such thing as biased science. 
there's it's a subject to replication, observation, and measurement. That's the essence of it. This is objective. Now, the I've also published a thing on Facebook at least regarding the regulation of about a 20 page document if you really want to understand the world of government regulations. And the one thing about greening thing that this is a this is a big issue is and the one thing is why you have to exercise caution here is that the one thing that will take place if there is global warming is a thing called population collapse. Now you can guess into this guy here and go ahead and do whatever you want, pollute all you want. The only thing is there may result in global population collapse. And what that means, billions of people could die as a result. Most likely the poorer people of the earth. But you can listen to Chuck, and we can take things safely and see to it that none of that happens. So who do you want to listen to? Thank you. Uh, Green future according to Charles. All right, Charlie. <laughs> All right, Mr. All right, your final rebuttal, right? It's 8.32 exactly. I'm Andy Anderson, and uh, I run an information service, free public service for the last 30 years out of Palatine. We condense or translate databases of books, 15, 20 books on a subject, into a one-page cliff note somebody can read. I haven't written a book myself. I've summarized the books of Nobel Prize winners from all over the world. Like Albert Einstein and 500 of his friends saying the earth isn't flat. Can you have a debate with a group like that? No, there's no way to combat the body of evidence, so you pay people to create doubt. You find one doubter that's willing to take money from the fossil fuel industry or whatever else it is and say the earth is flat, and you take one scientist out of Albert's group, and then you try to have a debate. And it gives the public the impression that there's uncertainty when there is none. This book, Merchants of Doubt, describes and names the names of the people that were funded by Philip Morris and the others in the tobacco industry to create doubt. Incidentally, Philip Morris was the first funder of climate denial. They said, we, we can't deny cigarettes and create doubt with any credibility unless we can point to other issues where there's doubt. So let's say that there's doubt in climate scientists and others and lump it in with tobacco. And then after the bubble burst in 2000, 1994, this Fred Cease, Fred Singer, and some others shifted over to taking money from Exxon, Mobil, to create doubt for fossil fuel industry and global warming. It turns out Exxon, Shell, Mobile, they all knew about the hazards of global warming back in the 70s. Um, I would like to compliment our speaker tonight. Uh, I think he gets the trophy as far as, uh, he's, he's better than one other speaker that we had 10 years ago, and the man's name was Michael Flores. And he gave a talk on 9-11 and laid down one falsehood after another for 90 minutes, we were totally buried in fantasy. Well, David is apparently able to stand in a blizzard of evidence claiming he can't see a single snowflake. And I don't know why. He's very intelligent, written books on his own, but he, he made some statements today that are 180 degrees out of phase from observable reality that can be confirmed by any seventh grader walking home from school. <laughs> Number one, this idea that we need nuclear power for energy, nuclear, there, any kind of nuclear power plant built anywhere in the world, there is no way to pay for it by selling kilowatts. It's the most expensive form of energy out there, other than, as Amory Levin said, yeah. burning $50 a pint brandy in your car for transportation. Number two, Take a look at Houston. Houston got four feet of water, 50 inches in one day, uh, from an enhanced hurricane. The hurricanes are getting stronger. It's due to man-made global warming, climate change, and also the climate is changing. 
we have pictures now of the ice melting at both poles. The ice is not increasing. It cycles up and down at the North Pole. It melts and freezes, melts and freezes. But the overall amount of ice at the North Pole is going down. So in the ice-free seasons, uh, cruise ships just sail right through there. Now where it used to be solid ice. One final thing. Ski resorts around the world are having to produce artificial snow or close down. Glaciers and snow caps are retreating in mountains all over the world. Uh, was in some of the in the East Coast, I forget is it someplace in Vermont or um, in Maryland. Maryland just had a thousand year flood two years ago. Going down Main Street, washing cars out. Nobody foresaw it, so that's where they built Main Street there. They didn't think it would flood. Well, they had a thousand year flood. Then, two years later, they have another thousand year flood. In Miami, certain segments of it are highways are underwater half the time now from uh, you know, the sea level coming ashore. The sea levels don't have to rise 10 feet to wipe, wipe out coastal cities. There's, there's so many, you know, as Jonathan said, there's no way to do a rebuttal in, in, in four minutes because each one of the falsehoods that was listed here tonight, I got five books written by the equivalent of Albert Einstein and 500 of his friends that yeah. devoted 30 years each to studying this. The database is solid, the forensic evidence is solid, and it's not just a few retired scientists that are sitting around uh, becoming denialists, uh, giving themselves a hobby. There's tens, not tens, hundreds of thousands of credible people, researchers, and scientists all over this planet that are publishing the database that exists on climate change and global warming. There is absolutely no doubt on this, and anybody that says it is in the category of these people that are paid to produce doubt for some reason. So I would like, in his rebuttal, I'd like David Ramsey to tell me is somebody paying him to produce this, or okay. is he just standing in a blizzard and claiming he can't see a single snowflake because that's a more comfortable needs some way time to, to get rebuttal. I'd like to know which isn't. Okay, thank you. All right. All right. Okay, David, you're up to rebut. Oh, just, you know, this guy, how much do you pay? I wish someone would pay me. Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, sure, uh, I keep on, um, I keep on sending an email to Exxon and saying, look, you know, this, you've got the spelling of my name right, and uh, this is probably, it doesn't seem to work. Um, no one ever pays me anything um, for this, anyway. Um, well, uh, I'll tr I'll, I've got jotted down a few things, and I'll try and respond to uh, things that I can see. Uh, um, the lady's left now, but she she said I call these people idiots. I actually didn't call them idiots at all. I said they're very intelligent people. And what what is the explanation when very intelligent people, very highly qualified, very highly educated, very well paid people are all like idiots? What's the explanation for that? Um, and I think there is this phenomenon in the history of belief. I mean, as probably some of you know, because I've spoken here before, my main interest is belief systems, why people believe things. Um, and um, uh, one, of the, one of the qualities of belief systems is uh, something called confirmation bias. Um, and, uh, you know, there is a phenomenon in the history of Christianity called fools for Christ. Uh, uh, where people made a virtue of the, of the fact that, uh, that their ramblings were idiotic. Uh, and this is what we have today with the Greens. Uh, they make a virtue of the fact that their ramblings are idiotic. So I, I, don't think that, um, I don't think that the people at the East Anglia are idiots at all. Uh, they're obviously um, uh, very good at getting money out of the government. Um, and um, uh, they obviously know a lot. Um, now, extreme weather events have been declining, and this is, you can just go and look up the statistics. Noah's own statistics show this. Uh, um, you would expect, now, bear in mind, you have to keep a distinction between what you think might happen in the future and what has happened. There isn't much disagreement about 
what has happened to global temperature. It has risen about one degree Celsius in 170 years. That's what's happened. Um, you may imagine that this is going to accelerate and we're going to have uh, some tremendous spurt in warming in the future. But what we actually know is there's been a, a fairly slight growth in global temperature comparable to thousands of previous incidents in the history of the Earth. In, uh, and following a very cold, uniquely cold period um, in the last 170 years. That's what we know. Um, now, um, we know something about sea level rise. We know the sea level rise. Sea, sea level has been rising for the past 10,000 years. We know that. It has not been accelerating in recent, in recent decades or centuries. Uh, and it's still going on very slowly. Um, uh, and um, if you have global warming, uh, you would expect to get fewer extreme weather events. You'd expect to get milder weather. And the reason for that is, uh, now I'm not saying this follows rigorously because weather is complicated, but the reason for that is you're reducing the disparity in temperature between the equator and the higher latitude. So there's one of the sources of turbulence that creates violent weather events is, uh, is that it's cold here and it's warm here. What, ha what happens with global warming is the whole Earth becomes more homogenized in temperature because the warming, all, the vast majority of the warming takes place away from the equator. In fact, what's happening with global warming, whenever there is warming, and, the, and let's repeat, thousands and thousands and thousands of times in the history of the Earth there has been warming. And thousands and thousands and thousands of times the history of the Earth has been much warmer than it is today without catastrophes. There may have been global catastrophes for a few people but not general catastrophes. Um, and so what happens when you get warming is that heat is being conveyed more efficiently from the equator. See, it's conveyed by ocean currents, and it's conveyed by air circulation. Uh, uh, for some reason, if you, if you see uh, warm, warming, global warming, uh, you're seeing heat being conveyed more efficiently away from the equator. Um, so you would expect fewer extreme weather events because there is less variation in temperature. Um, <clears throat> so, somebody, uh, several, more than one person, I think three people, mentioned uh, that I ridiculed people's predictions, and then I made this prediction about Chicago being under a kilometer of ice. Well, first of all, the predictions I ridiculed were all predictions that we know were completely false, not just slightly false, not just slightly off, but absolutely ludicrous. Our children are not gonna know what snow is in Britain. That is, that is, first of all, on its face, completely silly. Uh, and, uh, and, it hasn't, and they said it was going to happen, and it hasn't happened. Um, we've seen increasing snow in the last few years in Britain. So I was taking examples of respectable, highly qualified spokespeople for this cult who um, have made patently absurd predictions which have already been falsified. Now, if I say, 10,000 years from now, Chicago is, is going to be under a, over a kilometer of ice. Well, I'm, now, what I'm saying is this. I'm saying that what has happened many times before is going to happen again. We're in an ice age. In an ice age, uh, the period of glaciation lasts about 10 times longer than the interglacial. So if you get 10,000 uh, 10, years interglacial, you get 100,000 years, uh, roughly, very roughly. Uh, uh, of glaciation. Glaciation means that North America becomes like Greenland. And Greenland is under uh, several kilometers of ice, most of it. Uh, and, that, and that has happened to this part of the world several times before, many times before. Um, so now that doesn't mean that I'm infallible and that I, and, and that I, it, I couldn't be wrong about saying it's going to happen again. However, <clears throat> first of all, People here are very impressed by authorities and all that kind of stuff. It, uh, they don't impress me at all. But if you're impressed by authorities, what I have told you about Chicago being under more than a kilometer of ice in a few thousand years, we don't know when this, when the, exactly when this is going to happen. Any geologist will tell you it's true. Any yeah, geologist yeah. will tell you that's true. Um, so um, that doesn't mean it's correct. All the geologists could be wrong. 
uh, but I'm just pointing that out for those who are impressed by authority. Um, <clears throat> now, um, the fact that China and India are producing so much CO2, the lady who was here has left. She, she said, well, they're producing goods to be consumed in the United States. Well, I don't see what that's got to do with anything. But even if you, and it, but also, it's not true, because what's happening in China and India is a rapid growth of incomes. So they are buying more manufactured goods. Uh, the, you know, the, the rate of increase of real wages in China is well, has been well over 10% for many years. And, it, and, and that's one of the reasons why you're seeing a revival of manufacturing in the US. Because, um, because the people in China are buying the manufactured goods that are, uh, in the previous, uh, previous period were only being bought in the West. Um, <clears throat> so, in other words, they're catching up with the US. Um, and because they're catching up, because they're industrializing, they're producing a lot more CO2 than the US. And it's just a paradox of the political discussion that people will not face up to this. That if you are really seriously going to put emission con controls on and curb the emissions of CO2, you've got to go after India and China more than anybody in the world. I mean, the, the United States is a very minor uh, offender if you, call, if you think this is an offense. India and China you've got to go after. And of course, nobody, is, nobody who's in practical politics is prepared to do that. Uh, so, I mean, I, so what I'm saying is even if you believe this whole this whole stuff about CO2 uh, causing causing runaway global warming, which keeps on not happening according to their position. Uh, but even if you believe it, there is this unreality about the political approach. People will not go after these industrializing countries who are producing most of the CO2. Um, <clears throat> um, okay, well. Um, what's that? Clean up your room before you clean up the house. So, yeah, so um, uh, the point I really wanted to make, uh, above all in this, in this talk, was the nature of belief systems and how they change. Now, one, one thing you, that you have to understand is there have been periods where institutional science has been wrong. Uh, and it's, it's been exposed and they've changed direction. And I'm telling you with certainty, this is going to happen in the next few years. Uh, you're going to see it. So, uh, the idea that the default is that the people, what they're saying now, must be right, is a bit silly. So, <laughs> and, and the other thing you must always remember is, everything I say is true. Remember that. <laughs> Thank you, David. All right, Andy, get all us out, please. Thank you for an enlightening presentation, and we're adjourned for this week. We'll see you all next week. Thank you for coming. All right.